Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Clady Davis III, and I have the privilege of kicking off this symposium, Big Ideas in Counseling Psychology, Uprooting Anti-Blackness. For those I have not had the privilege of meeting, I'm a psychologist and director of training at the University of California, Berkeley, which I'll acknowledge uh, remains on the unceded land of the Ohlone people. This symposium is part of Dr. Mary O'Leary Wiley's Big Ideas in Counseling Psychology Initiative. In addition to thanking Dr. Wiley for dedicating presidential hours for this discussion today, on behalf of the presenters, we wanna thank the tri-chairs of this uh, symposium, Dr. Sharon Bowman, Marty Cooper, and Carmen Cruz. Also, we have four spectacular presenters today, uh, Drs. Helen Neville, Dr. Della Mosley, Dr. Carlton Green, and Janet, Dr. Janet Helms. They're each gonna present one big idea that addresses and or disrupts anti-blackness anti and or anti-black racism. We're gonna hear from all four presenters and then we'll open it up for uh, dialogue with the audience as well as for the presenters to have discussion amongst themselves. Dr. Cruz has graciously uh, agreed to help me monitor the chat. Okay. So, and please feel free to send messages to myself or Dr. Cruz in the chat, and we'll do our best to, to monitor them. So our first presenter that I'd like to introduce is Dr. Neville. Dr. Helen A. Neville is a professor of educational psychology and African-American studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is the past president of the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race, and past associate editor of the Counseling Psychologist and Journal of Black Psychology. Dr. Neville has co-edited seven books and co-authored or authored over hundred articles on areas of race, racism, racial identity, and diversity issues related to well-being. Dr. Neville has been recognized for her research and mentoring efforts, including receiving the Association of Black Psychologists Distinguished Psychologist of the Year Award, the APA Minority Fellowship Award, the, the Domus Taylor Award for Outstanding Research Contribution, the APA Graduate Students Award, Kenneth and Mamie Clark Award, the Charles and Shirley Thomas Award for Mentoring and Contributions to African-American Students and Community. And finally, my favorite, the Winter Roundtable, Janet E. Helms Mentoring Award. Dr. Neville, I will share my screen and share your slides. Thank you so much. I am um, very humbled and honored to be in this space. Um, really, really thank you. Um, and so I think as I've told a, a few people, that I am um, having a, a couple of little health issues, so I will not be uh, sharing my video today. So just bear with me. Um, I want to thank uh, Clady for his amazing uh, leadership skills in facilitating it. Um, we have been um, pretty challenging as a group, I wanna say. So I'm, well, thank you so much. And thank you for the uh, vision of the organizer of this. I'm incredibly humbled. Just wanna start off with my positionality, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and I am on the lands of Kickapoo, Chickasaw, Muscatine nations, among other nations. And I'm coming to you speaking from a black uh, woman feminist perspective. And as I thought about the challenge, I wanted to kind of focus on this radical, uh, black radical imagining and thinking about what would a world look like in which black people, um, um, in which we are living our ancestors' wildest dreams. So if we can go to the, the next slide, please. All right, um, in this slide, I want to evoke the words and spirit of our wonderful ancestor, Maya Angelou, who has given us so many um, incredible poems and powerful words. And in this, it comes from her um, poem, I Rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Let's just play a little. Just 
just wanted to start us off uh, with the right tone here. And so part of my words is a meditation of the notion of I rise and what it means to dream. The image on the right is by Ru Russell Joseph Ledet, who recently um, is a two-lane medical student and they visited a plantation and where they have this housing where formerly enslaved people lived. And in that he tweeted, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, the entire, you know, all these beautiful black medical students. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, another aspect of my comments and really are much more meditations is building on the brilliant work of Robin D.G. Kelly, who's a historian at, um, and he talks a lot about black liberation. He's a historian at UCLA. Two decades ago, he wrote a book, Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination, um, which is an incredibly powerful book. If you haven't read it, I definitely encourage you to take a look at that. And in the book, he talks about dreams um, and what his Black freedom dreams are of the land of Black liberations, of reparations. And then he talks about the kinds of dreaming he was doing third world dreaming and black feminist dreaming. But he concludes his uh, powerful book with this quote, struggle is uh, par for the course when our dreams go into action. But unless we have the place to imagine and vision of what it means fully to realize our humanity, all the protests and demonstrations in the world won't bring about our liberation. And I think this is so incredibly powerful and it really shapes part of what we're doing because this idea about having space to envision what is possible. So many of us are working nonstop, um, are going from job to job or doing so many things that we don't actually have the space to realize and to think thoroughly about what is um, possible for us and the unimaginable. We can go to the next slide, please. In thinking about this, I wanted to talk about two things. One is what happens when a dream is deferred? What happens when um, Black folks dream of what is possible doesn't happen? And I just love this quote. It's a powerful quote from Langston Hughes, dream deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester in the sun and then run? Does it, um, I can't even read it. Does it still stink um, like rotten meat um, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just uh, was like um, a heavy load or does, um, does it explode? I think that is so powerful. And in thinking through this, I wanted to talk about then what limits our dreams? What limits the freedom um, dreams that Robin Kelly talks about? And I really think that there's a number of things, but three things stand out. One is this ubiquity of racial and other forms of oppression that Black people are faced with the daily onslaught of racial oppression in the forms of economic and food insecurities, in the forms of um, unsafe neighborhoods and poverty for some, in the forms of schools and other systems where we are dehumanized. I mean, these are things that um, take its toll on us, as we know. We're also in terms of things that limit our freedom are these temporary pleasures and low hanging fruit within the capitalist system. And so because life can be so tough for us sometimes, it's not always tough because we know our communities also experience joy and we have so many cultural strengths. So I don't wanna downplay that. But at the same time, through these other forms of oppression, um, the ways in which racism interface with sexism and heterosexism and other forms of ism, it makes it uh, us turn to material things to have some comfort. 
maybe a new pair of shoes, maybe it's a new car, maybe it's this new apartment and all we deserve all of those uh, things. But when we only look to those to provide us comfort to deal with some of the pain that we're under, that limits us for dreaming about what is possible beyond those material things. And the other is this idea um, that Robin Kelly left us with, is this limited space to dream and reimagine. Um, where do we have space in school settings, in work settings, in our family lives to sit and dream and reimagine the possibility? New slide. So in thinking through this, I identified Three, there's a lot of things, but I've identified three ways that counseling psychology can support black, black radical imagination. And I intentionally use this idea of support here because I don't think we need counseling psychologists leading. Um, I don't think that we need them creating the vision, et cetera, not as a discipline. And at the same time, I also want to acknowledge that there are lots of us black counseling psychologists, and maybe we need to really emphasize a field of black radical liberatory counseling psychology where we can do some of that work. But counseling psychology as a whole does not need to take the lead on this. The three issues that I will unpack in a few minutes are using psychological science and applied skills to actualize reparations, um, adopting an abolitionist black liberation approach to counseling psychology and fostering radical hope. If we can go to the next slide. Um, I realize that the words here are a little um, are a little hard to, to read, but we'll walk through this. Um, the movement for black lives among other folks have really pushed for this idea of reparations. So when counseling psychology is a field and other white allies think about how can we support black lives, part of supporting black lives is supporting this idea of reparations, which I know is pretty scary for some people. Um, reparations as a movement is not new, but it's gained some additional traction in the last couple of years. The United Nations talks about five kind of dimensions of reparations that I think we need to think through. And these aren't the only ways of thinking through reparations. And part of what I'm going to talk about is the assumption that people are on board with reparations for the history and legacy of slavery of, um, um, black, uh, of uh, black folks in the United States and abroad. So part of the first part is restitution or rest, um, restoration of a victim's right, property, citizenship, and status. What is it gonna take to create restitution for hundreds of years of stolen labor and stolen lives? Black folks, um, and enslaved black folks literally built the wealth of this country. What does it mean to have restitution there? People also don't realize that rehabilitation is a component of reparations. And this is where the field of counseling psychology can play a critical role in supporting. What is rehabilitation? That is really an aspect of providing psychological and physical support for health. Think about radical healing. How is it that we can support the efforts of radical healing? How do we support the efforts of folks like um, the Association of Black Psychologists providing um, um, you know, emotional emancipation circles? Um, can we push for these at a national level in which black healers are working with black communities on what this healing looks like. And these notions of rehabilitation and the healing, I want to be clear, is not necessarily about healing 
uh, race relations. That's not the conversation now. That might be another conversation down the road. We're not interested at this particular point in focusing how whites and blacks can get along and how they can repair the historical damage. Other issues also are compensation, which is really important. I know that there are some proponents of reparations which focus on individual level compensations like payouts. I'm not um, necessarily a proponent of that. Compensation can be in other forms and that's where the dreaming comes in. What compensation do we need? We need jobs, we need housing, we need quality schools, we need land to build and grow our food. So compensation is not necessarily individual, it is a collective component. Um, satisfaction, which really deals with where folks who have done the um, wrong have acknowledged guilt, created an apology, constructed memorials. And this is where, this is where white folks do their work and do a deep work and a deep dive in there. And then the guarantee of non-repetition um, through our laws and structures. And here now we need to think about while we're, people would not say, yes, we're pushing for um, slavery, they are pushing to suppress votes. They are pushing people out of adequate housing. There are ways that they are repeating extreme forms of um, economic and other forms of exploitation and dehumanization. So what role does psychology have to play? Um, there's lots of attention now on this. WT Grant, for example, um, um, their foundation, believe it or not, has um, recently put out an announcement to support research on reparations for Black American descendants of enslaved persons. Even foundations are looking at the importance of this. I would like to see counseling psychology support the movement for Black lives, efforts for reparations, make a public notion of this support, again, not playing a, uh, playing a role in leadership, and then begin to think about how can they think about reparations in counseling psychology? We need to do a deep dive. What role has counseling psychology played in dehumanizing black folks? Um, what are the things that we need to unpack there? So that is um, in terms of reparations. If we can go to the next slide, please. The other is this uh, liberatory abolitionist approach. I want to acknowledge and thank like Annalise Singh for her amazing um, presidential initiative that focused on liberation psychology that really brought attention to this issue. I know that there are people in this room. I believe that uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Mosley were part of the initiative and helping. And I know there was other people in the room who were also part of that. And I'm sorry, I am not, I, I'm missing your name. What we haven't talked about that other um, like education and other folks are talking is this idea about abolition. And I would love to see how abolition kinds of work can be married with the excellent work that liberation psychology is doing and the work that folks like black psychology is doing. If you aren't hip to Bettina Love, y'all need to be hip to Bettina Love. If you haven't seen, if you haven't read, we want to do more than survive. Abolitionist teaching and the pursuit of educational freedom. Pick that book up now. There are so many gems in there. And one of the quotes when, when she talks about abolitionist teaching uh, um, really talks about the practice of working in solidarity with communities of color while drawing on the imagination, creativity, refusal, remembering, visioning, thinking, healing, the rebellious spirit, spirit the boldness, the determination, the subversiveness of abolitionist eradicate injustices in and outside. She's talking about the school, but we can talk about in and outside therapy, in and outside psychology, in and outside so many of the systems in which we work. And I like this quote because she has sections on the notion of mattering and the practice of abolitionist teaching rooted in the internal desire we all have for freedom, joy, restorative justice, that's restoring humanity, not just rules, and to matter to ourselves, our community, our family, our country, and the profound understanding that we must, 
demand what is impossible. And so this is particularly a challenge for us Black psychologists to begin to think about how we center mattering in our work, how we can center the voices of Black folks in particularly demanding what is impossible and keeping the, dis keeping the pressure on. Because we know that without uh, um, out us creating our vision, we cannot trust other people to have a vision for ourselves. And there is some work that counseling psychologists can um, um, help. So I think, you know, the challenge here is um, what would then um, a training model look like that trains all folks to begin to think about abolitionist black liberation um, teaching. What does our pro sim look like? What do our introductory courses look like? What does research method look like? What do practicum look like? So begin to think and um, think outside of the box and completely differently. By way of um, just, we're gonna transition into the last piece and maybe we can go to the next um, slide, please, Clady. Thank you so much. Um, and in this slide, I want to evoke the words, um, before I talk about radical hope, um, evoke the words continuing of uh, Bettina Love and what an abolitionist counseling psychology, what we could be fighting for. And in her words, she talks about things such as a world that has yet to be created um, and for children's dreams that have yet to be crushed by anti-Blackness. So this is really our task. Uh, a world that is yet to be created and a world where children's dreams have not been crushed by anti-Blackness. And this so beautifully fits into this concept of radical hope. As you all know, when working with the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective, um, this is something where Della Mosley is the first author, also working with um, Nayeli uh, chavez Duenas, Hector Adamas, Gioni Lewis, and Brianna, Brianna French on this particular um, piece. And here we're really trying to think and unpack um, you know, freedom dreams is essentially what it is. And so radical hope involves a steadfast belief in the collective capacity contained within communities of color to heal and transform oppressive forces into a better future despite overwhelming odds. I wanna focus on a couple of pieces here because I realize my time is coming to an end. So um, I, um, the pieces that I want to focus that I think are the most important here is for us to be forward, for, uh, forward focusing is this idea of envision, envisioning possibilities and what role counseling psychology can have in supporting this idea of envisioning possibilities. So returning to Robin Kelly's comments earlier about not having space, I want to challenge counseling psychology as a field to create that space for others. How are we fostering and creating spaces for children to dream the unimaginable before their dreams are crushed or before they're already limited, before we're already limiting their thinking. What are, how are we, are we working th with them through art, through therapy, through dance, starting from kindergarten all the way, um, even as older from the cradle to the grave, as folks say, we should always be creating this space for envisioning what is possible because we need that intergenerational dreaming um, that is so important. The other is the piece of meaning and purpose. I'd like to challenge counseling psychology to help, uh, uh, not to help, to support um, the ideas of developing critical consciousness among um, right. black folks. There are some folks doing some excellent work. I know that Della Mosley has done some excellent work around critical consciousness. In what ways are we creating awareness like of um, uh, awareness of our social on. conditions? Um, how are we educating people about that? This is going to be particularly critical as we are seeing a backlash in terms of uh, critical race theory. Uh, we still have to educate our babies about this because without understanding this, they're not going to be action. But also in addition to the critical consciousness has to be is like, 
I also, my purpose in life, a piece of my purpose in life is making things better. That I know that my ancestors have made sacrifices for me and it is my duty to make sacrifices for others to make things better. How do we cultivate that um, notion of critical consciousness which really gets into this purpose and meaning of radical hope? Um, and if we could go to the, uh, I think it's the last slide. All right, because uh, I think I've already gone over, but when I think about things, um, if we could play, oh, does a song play? Does it play? Let me check. Okay. I'm not hearing it. Okay, that's okay. I was hoping the song would play, but- um, You can sing it. Oh, that would not be good. That would not be good. Um, and it was just essentially a song about freedom and joy and black joy. And what I'd like to encourage folks to think about, um, if you are black, I would like for you to reflect on one thing that you can leave this um, conversation with that is going to commit to creating, dreaming and liberating uh, black folks. That's what, and if you are um, a not black person, what one thing might you be willing to do in terms of um, supporting um, this liberation and dreaming process all the way from supporting um, reparations, creating space for folks to dream and thinking about what are making a commitment to an approach that embraces abolitionist and black liberation um, in counseling psychology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Neville, for getting us started with that provocative talk. <clears throat> well, next up, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Janet E. Helms. Dr. Helms is the Augustus Long Professor Emeritus and Founding Director of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture and Diversity Challenge at Boston College. She has served as President, Council Representative, and Secretary of the, Counseling, of, of the Society of Counseling Psychology. Dr. Helms is a fellow in Division 17, 35, and 45. She has chaired the dissertation committees of over 60 mostly counseling psychology students and students of color and or, mar or, and or from marginalized communities. She has written over 80 empirical and theor theoretical articles, book chapters and books on the topics of racial identity and cultural influences on assessment and counseling practice. Dr. Helms was the recipient of the 2017-2018 Lifetime Achievement and Mentoring Award from the Society of Counseling Psychology. The 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race, and the APA-APF Gold Medal Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Public Interest. Additionally, Dr. Helms delivered the American Psychological Foundation's 2019 Arthur W. Stott Lecture on Unifying Psychology. Thank you, Dr. Helms. Well, after all of our practicing, now I can't figure out how to get into uh, showing you my, my <laughs> slides without the... Uh, at the bottom, bottom right, there's a little thing looks like a screen. Lower, lower, lower. Keep going in right there. Yeah, right to your left. To my it left. Like, no, it looks like a little screen uh, on the bottom row. All the way to the right. Let's see. I don't think so. Okay, you can go to slideshow up top. Uh, whatever you're doing is covering my. Oh, sorry. My, uh, <laughs> my, 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 sorry. Well, anyway, in the interest of starting, maybe I'll figure this out as we go. I'm also happy to share the screen. I'll share your slides myself if you prefer. But you don't quite have the right one, so. Okay. Anyway, can can you see can you see this? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend it's the way it's supposed to be until I figure out what to do. Um, I want to maybe, if I'd known she was going to talk about it, pick up on uh, Dr. Neville's idea of reparations. And in a sense, this is a conversation about reparations. I want us to imagine a world where we would train black graduate students where they did not have to do a GRE in order to be admitted into counseling psychology. 
I think if psychology were to eliminate the GRE as an admission criteria, that would move us towards rejecting anti-Black racism. So here are my goals. I want to provide a rationale for uh, treating the GRE as a test that's biased against Black test takers. I want to redefine bias in hopefully easy to understand examples. I want to provide a case example of the effects of bias. And then I want to suggest that rejecting GRE scores as, a cri as criteria for admissions of Black applicants would be counseling psychology's opportunity to exercise its value of diversity, social justice, and inclusion. Um, most of what I will present that refers comes from much of what I present comes from data that's online at the Educational Testing Service, uh, the Educational Testing Service ETS, or the people who do the statistics of the for the GRE and provide the guidelines essentially for how we want to use it. Um, GR, so ETS says. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you noticed at the beginning, I actually am co-authoring this with uh, Khalil Duperry, who is, a, I guess you would say, a former graduate student. He's an ABI, all but internship. And it was he who said to me, we ought to do something about the GRE because it's keeping a lot of good people out of the program. And so he kind of forced me to focus on this topic, whereas I was focusing on other testing before. So ETS says that GRE scores have an important role in the admissions process because they serve as an, a common objective measure. But then they say that, that you can compare students from different backgrounds on this objective measure. So in the social questions, justice questions that uh, Khalil raises, he says, well, if backgrounds are different, how is it that you, that you can assume that there's a common basis for the scores that you're using? How, you, how can you assume that they're objective? Uh, ETS says, on average, members of different racial, ethnic, and economic backgrounds perform differently on standardized tests. But they say this doesn't matter because these same score differences are seen in all standardized tests. So doesn't that mean that we are standardizing the tests to be biased against people? How, how is it fair to say, we know there's a bias and we're going to make you take a test that we already know the outcome of? ETS says, well, despite our extensive work to ensure that the GRE tests are free from bias, uh, there still are disparities in performing among underrepresentative groups. So if you know that there are these disparities, if bias is always there, for, particularly for Black people in this case, doesn't that mean we're always privileging white people, particularly over black people when we administer the GRE. Now, this is the conversation that makes people mad at me. And so particularly testing people. And so they often send me bad comments, but I'm gonna to try to uh, think about, ask us to think about bias differently. How ETS thinks about bias is that it's essentially the, the uh, fault of the black people who take the test. They say that uh, if they didn't, if they don't take the right courses, they don't have the right interests, they don't have the right knowledge and skills, they don't have the right uh, educational background, they don't uh, and get their social systems don't allow them to have equal opportunity, and that's why you see the differences in performance. Well, one could ask if that's the case, then why are we uh, administering tests and using tests as our admissions criteria if even the test developers know that this is a problem? Well, I'm, I um, am going to say that racial categories, which is how we define race in psychology, are not theoretical constructs. And therefore, they can't explain a group or an individual's test scores. And it's kind of easy for you to think about that. If you think about when you check the box defining you as Black, if you are Black, or something else, if you are something else, is there any particular attitude, behavior, or emotion that you think of as a, as a Black emotion? Uh, it's not. Psychologists study behaviors that are related to things as independent variables. Racial categories aren't independent variables. They're just a, a holder, a placeholder, if you will. So suppose that bias is a statistical artifact. 
in which test takers outnumber Blacks in such huge numbers or proportions that whatever the test measures is swamped by the population sample size disparities. Think about that. There are so many white people relative to the other people who take the test that you don't really know whether any of the things that uh, ETS proposes or that um, others of us would propose, we don't know if that's a problem because there are too many white people to allow us to figure that out. And so let me just give you a, a simple example, I hope, of why that is a problem. Imagine that you come to my house and I offer you a piece of pie. And after one taste, you start asking me, well, what's in your pie? So I decide to share my secret family recipe and we're gonna go around, around the pie clockwise, uh, starting at the 30 minute place where you see uh, uh, the, the brown swatch, which I call flour. 57% of my pie is flour. And then if I move around to the left, the next thing I have in my pie is salt. 4% of my pie is salt. 15% uh, of my pie is water. Uh, then I have a little vanilla. 4% is vanilla. Uh, then I go around and I have about 1% cinnamon. And then I have 7% butter. And I have a itty bitty, itty bitty bitty piece of pineapple, 0.3%. Uh, and then I have cocoa, which is 7%, and caramel, which is 1%. And then I have sprinkles, which are 4%. And all of those make up my pie. So if you think about it, which, which, which of my ingredients would have the most influence on, we are how, also living in a time. on how my pie tastes? Uh, are we getting an echo? Uh, how, which would have the most influence on how our pie, my pie tastes? Uh, you would probably guess that it's flour, because I assume it would. You might. You also probably wouldn't like my pie too much. Um, but okay, so that's my pie. Now that's a that's a hopefully a practical example. But what if we suppose instead of a pie, we're talking about the norm for the GRE? And the norm has the same percentages of racial groups as my pie hat. Now I should say that uh, ETS, and most of us might not know this, actually does um, uh, develops norms based on three years of test performance. And it changes every year and you never know exactly which years you're being compared to if you take the test or if you use the test. But having said that, and they also don't present the norms uh, differently for math and uh, uh, verbal reasoning, although they use different sample sizes. So that's my caveat. But anyway, so I did my own averages. And if you look at the most recent three year period, still we have flour who's uh, dominating in, in, the, in our uh, mean. Uh, what happens if you is, if you multiply the proportion of white people times their mean score, for example, then you know how much they're they are contributing to the mean. Similarly, if you multiply the proportion of Black people by their mean score, you know how much they're contributing and Asians, how much they're contributing and so on. And so collectively, they equal the total mean that you're compared to. So what that means then if um, going around our, our pie, whites are contributing 57%, what's called others are con or, uh, contributing 4%, uh, people who didn't respond at all to the racial category question or contributing 15%. So uh, essentially 76% uh, uh, is defined by white people, people who were others and people who didn't tell you what they were. That leaves only a little bit of the pie to be influenced by the racial ethnic groups who take the test. And over here we see that black people as with the pie are only about 7% of influence in the total norms. So what that means is that they actually had no influence in shaping what it is that we're measuring when we use these norms to describe the people uh, who take the test. Well, let's take a look at what that means. Uh, 
whenever you compare a black individual's GRE test scores to the, to the norms using that, that norm uh, configuration that I showed you, the black people in this case are at a numerical disadvantage. In fact, all of the racial ethnic groups are at a disadvantage, but um, uh, all the groups of color at least, but the black group is at a disadvantage. And I wanna give you an example of how that works. Uh, Chandra, my percentile ex example, uh, is sort of a prototype of many of the black students I have worked with over the course of my career. And so I'm sort of blending some people here to uh, show what I mean. So she is a self-identified 22 year old black cisgender woman. She graduated from a predominantly white quote unquote prestigious university with a 3.89 in psychology. Her GPA included what she describes as a, as a rough first year in pre-med. She took the GRE on the advice of an academic advisor. She had received no mentoring while she was the stellar psychology student in her psychology department. And she entered a master's program in counseling, um, mental health counseling, uh, because she'd been rejected by all of the doctoral programs in counseling psychology to which she applied. Um, Chandra, like many of the people I work with, would not tell me for a whole year what her GREs were. She was so, so ashamed of how she had performed on, on the GREs. So already we have a person with potential who is doubting uh, her abilities because of a test that we know is biased because the test developers tell us it's a biased test. All right, so her scores, verbal reasoning, she had a 156, which is even by the SKU standards, placed her at the 73rd percentile. So that was a pretty good score. That means that she scored higher than 73% of the uh, people who took the test during whatever the three year period was that she took the test. Um, and so that doesn't look too awful. We move over, however, to her quantitative reasoning and it's a 144. Uh, which places her at the 16th percentile, which is one standard deviation below the mean of the people who took the test. Um, we don't know actually whether uh, the, we know the percentiles that uh, were presented. We don't know what the sample size was because as I mentioned, there are different numbers of people who take quantitative versus verbal reasoning and we don't know, we don't know that. GRE doesn't tell us the exact numbers, but anyway, pretending that our numbers are right. Let's compare her to black people who took the test. And I want to pause here to say that everyone who takes this test is assuming that they have the potential to go on to graduate school. They presumably graduated or, or at least are about to graduate from college. And so they're looking towards their future. So what if we compare her to other black future oriented black uh, people, black people, we find out that the same score is equal to the 88th percentile. So now she's performing higher than 88% of the people of the black people who took the test. Well, let's move her over to quantitative. Quantitative, she's performing at exactly the same level, the mean level of the people who took the test, which puts her at the 50th percentile. Uh, better than half, not as good as half. Well, then we can say, well, what happens if we transfer her scores back to the skewed distribution that we had before? And then we see that if we really adjusted her scores to take it into account that there are so many more white people than there are people of color, then in fact, her score for verbal reasoning should have been 161, so higher by five points. Her score for quantitative should have been 154, higher by 10 points. She still would have been average in her, in her math performance, but she would have been much higher in her uh, verbal reasoning performance. And so in general, the scores that the percentiles that were used underrepresented the whatever it is that the GREs measure with respect to Chandra. Okay, so here's some applications. Chandra's scores were underestimated. There's no way that we can really determine what her true score is because she's always being compared to a predominantly white mean. Even when we're comparing her to other black people, no, we're comparing her with respect to a test that was normed on predominantly white people and no response people and other people. 
many applic black applicants will not be admitted to programs because of such comparisons. Uh, I'm guessing that Chandra was not admitted because of her quantitative score. Black applicants who are admitted with low scores, quote unquote, are often stereotyped by counseling psychology faculty who believe in the GRE. So I don't know if it's been your experience, but my experience has often been, well, we're letting you in, but we don't really think that you can make it in the program. And so the person is always under that shadow of, I wasn't good enough. And often they will ask me, well, why was I admitted to the program? Because believe it or not, apparently grad students sit around and talk about what their GRE scores were, particularly, I guess, in the presence of black students. I don't know what that means. All right. so. eliminate use of the GRE as the admissions criterion. Consider that in 1996, which was apparently the last time GRE did, really did any uh, research on its measure, black test takers uh, top three intended majors were social work, uh, education administration, and counseling psychology. They wanted to join our field. If we were to eliminate the GRE, we would demonstrate it's our commitment to the counseling value of social justice, diversity, inclusion, and beyond, uh, and it would be beyond the academic setting. Doing so would open the opportunity doors for more Black applicants whose uh, admittance relies on conformance to whiteness, whatever whiteness is, standards, or the deficit model. Doing so would begin the process of removing standardized tests as the primary method for evaluating and stereotyping Black people across systems. So it's not only our programs that uh, use tests in this way. If we look at society, many of the important life transitions are characterized by having to pass somebody's version of a standardized test. And additionally, promoting social justice is at the core of counseling psychologists' professional uh, activities. Uh, that's from the uh, model counseling training program. So if black applicants want us, shouldn't we want them? And shouldn't we do what we can to remove this oppressive system from their lives so that they can live up to the kind of potential that Dr. Neville was talking about in her presentation? And I guess those are, these are my thought questions. How would admissions decisions be made if the GRE were eliminate, eliminated? And what is it that we care about in counseling psychology trainees that is, is or isn't captured by GRE scores? The end. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Helms. I agree. I think that was a nice uh, build upon what Dr. Neville, how Dr. Neville got us started. Um, and it's already so I see a question and a comment already in the comment section that we'll address a little later. All right, thank you. So next we have Dr. Colton Green. Uh, Dr. Green is the Director of Diversity Training and Education in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Maryland College Park. Prior to taking on this role, he served as a staff psychologist at the university's counseling center. Dr. Green has developed and presented workshops on diversity and inclusion, including how to address racial trauma at many universities and colleges in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, as well as nationally. He's also served as a national advisor to the SPEED Fund, the nation's only mental health organization focused on the well being of students of color. Dr. Green is an active member in the American, Psycho American Psychological Association, where his contributions to the field earned him a Rising Star Award at the 2019 National Multicultural Conference and Summit. Also in 2019, the American Psychological Association recognized Dr. Green with the Grady Dale Jr. Award for outstanding contributions to diversity in psychology. And in 2020, Dr. Green was awarded the Committee on Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity's Outstanding Achievement Award. Dr. Green is also serves as president at the Historical Street Baptist Church, the Health and Coaching Ministry. Welcome, Dr. Green. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be here and um, it is really, 
almost mind blowing to be following up behind Helen Neville and Janet Hills <laughs> and being a part of this conversation and then coming in front of um, Della Mosley. Um, it's really a privilege to be invited to be a part of this conversation today. Um, I am here in Largo, I guess I'm College Park, Maryland on the, on the land of, of the Piscataway people. So I definitely pay respects to them. Um, the, the, what I wanna talk about today, um, if, you can, if you can't tell when we were putting this together, um, Dr. Neville was gonna talk about some, some uh, general dreaming. Um, Dr. Helms was gonna talk about getting people into the program and I'm gonna talk about being in the program. Um, I wanna say before I start here with this conversation that I am a counseling psychologist, a proud counseling psychologist. Dr. Helms did a great job of helping me um, and my colleagues to really appreciate being counseling psychologists. The conversation that I want to bring to you today is out of that love, out of that appreciation for counseling psychology. Um, I want to recognize and acknowledge that some of what it is that I may share could be challenging for people um, with regards to reimagining um, counseling psychology. We were given approximately 15 minutes to talk about some big idea related to uprooting anti-Blackness in counseling psychology. And so as somebody who, well, I want to say I love the training program, uh, no, that could, wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, the training program was really formative for me, and I find myself still working in training spaces, but also having the opportunity to work with um, additional counseling psychology trainees. And so a lot of what I want to share with you today is from my own interactions with students in counseling psychology programs, talking to people, always talking to people about considering counseling psychology as a profession um, as when they're thinking about doing something in mental health. Um, and then I also want to make sure that I just share with you maybe a little bit of some of my own experiences as well as we think about what it could look like to actually be a different field. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in with my big idea. Here it is. Um, I'm going to advocate that we discontinue grounding our courses and our coursework in the ideas, values, and intellectual labor of white hegemony and white supremacists, right? Um, while we also make a shift maybe with providing trainees with a foundational experience that actually centers the voices, imagination, and intellectual honesty of black scholars. Ooh, scholars didn't make it onto, um, onto the, the, the slide there. And when I say scholars, I actually really mean black people, right? Um, because there are ways that black people generate knowledge that is not necessarily placed in a journal or a textbook somewhere. Said another way, I think I just wanna highlight here really briefly that what I want us to be thinking about is um, in the first year of counseling psychology training, it would be optimal in my opinion for counseling psychology students and faculty to actually grapple with understanding the history, the foundations and application of black psychology by, immer by immersing themselves in the perspectives of critically conscious black practitioners, scientists, advocates, and policymakers. Now, what I'm saying here explicitly is teach black psychology in the first year of people coming to the program. And that becomes everybody's responsibility and not just Dr. Neville's responsibility and not just Dr. Helms's responsibility, but every faculty member's responsibility to teach black psychology. Now, moving forward, what I wanna be able to do is draw a little bit, Dr. Helms mentioned this a little bit earlier. She talked about the counseling psychology model training program. And so in preparing for this today, I read this, this um, third article about um, the model uh, model training program. This is the third iteration of of this um, uh, of, of the training program. And in the program, they they highlight four values, and I just put two of them there: holistic and contextual. Um, there's always something about diversity and social justice and the values of counseling psychology. And then you'll see that there are these six clusters of principles that are also in, um, enumerated in the paper. And these are just um, uh, three of them: multiculturalism, diversity, and social justice is there as well. What I wanna be able to highlight for us starting off is that it might be really important for us to think about the fact that focusing on diversity and social justice actually may not be getting us to the place where we wanna be going. One of the things that Dr. Helms has written, I think in um, a, a reply to some of the, the, the Four Whiteness articles that came out a few years ago in The Counseling Psychologist is that she really highlighted that when we wanna include everybody in the conversation, when we wanna include all of the diverse identities in conversation, um, what often happens is that racism gets the short shrift. Right. It does not get focused on so that we can focus on these other pieces, probably more often than not, because racism makes people probably the most uncomfortable in these conversations. 
So we move towards or we advocate for this huge sense of inclusivity. And what we end up doing, in my opinion, is we leave people of color out and maybe even we leave black people out of the conversation in some really fundamental ways. I'm gonna encourage people to, to take a look at Dr. D.L. Stewart's um, article um, titled Ideologies of Absence, Anti-Blackness and Inclusion Rhetoric in Student Affairs Practice. They are writing specifically about student affairs, but what they are saying here in this article is that the rhetoric of diversity and inclusion is inherently anti-black. Um, they cite four ways that this shows up, one of them being belonging, right? And, and they put un in front of every one of these um, characteristics, but belonging. What they offer is that we're all subject to these belongingness narratives. I mean, we should be asking belonging to what, right? Um, and in counseling psychology, what we would be talking about is belonging to the model training program, which again, if we're using um, the language of diversity and inclusion, we are trying to include so many people that we may be leaving some people out. One of the pieces that, that, that Dr. Stewart points out in their article is that as we are doing this notion, uh, trying to do this dance around diversity and inclusion, what we oftentimes do is we wanna make everybody feel like they're members of the community. We wanna make everybody feel like um, they, are, they have the same rights within the community. And we don't pay attention to histories of exclusion whereby everybody has not always had access to these or some people have had more access than others, but we want to say that everybody's on equal footing, and that's just not the case. They, she also, they, they also point out that um, the, the belonging piece means sometimes, or more often than not, it might mean that Black people have to figure out how to fit in physically or dispositionally um, with, with white supremacy types of values. We have to be deemed a good fit, possibly by the GRE scores that Dr. Helms was referring to. And if we don't fit, then faculty do look at us and we can begin to take in some of those negative attitudes. Um, in, in a belonging um, situation, black people are expected to actually provide care, comfort and education to other people at our own expense. Right. Um, and so that becomes a uh, it becomes a real challenge in, in, uh, in the training program for us to be using this language that is supposed to be so um, encompassing when, in fact, it doesn't necessarily encompass black people. The other piece here is that um, safety is also one of the you know, hallmarks of talking about diversity and inclusion in, in these um, settings where we find ourselves. And Dr. Stewart says that that inclusion is safety, feeling safe and being safe from too much challenge. And having been a, a black male doctoral student, having talked to so many other black um, counseling psychology students, one of the things that often happens in the context of our training program is that we don't ask the question safety for whom? Because more often than not, we're talking about safety for white students while ignoring what feels safe or what should be safe for black people as we are there and being expected to do the care work, to do the comforting work and to, the, to do the edu um, educational work about um, racialized experiences, okay? So I put that up for us to, to really, uh, I want us to be thinking about challenging this notion of what diversity and inclusion means in counseling psychology training and practice, because it may not necessarily be meaning exactly what we want it to, want it to mean. Me. Now, here in this space, what I want to be able to highlight too before I move into talking about um, the big idea is um, now I've, I've, you saw my title: um, "White Black Wellness Does Not Eat White Does Not Equal White Hegemony." Now, we were told to talk a little bit about um, uprooting anti-blackness. I want to put this up really quickly from Williamsburg Clay and Bridges: "Anti-blackness: This Long-Standing and Persistent Cultural Disregard for Black People in America." society's preoccupation with and striving towards black social death. They say that anti-blackness is the erasure of blackness from all forms of social life. As black people are positioned as the embodiment of problem, and it's a persistent imagery and discourse that construct black people and culture as devoid of value. Now I put that out there because I think that it becomes important for us to think about um, in the context of the training program, what I would want you to be asking yourself is how does anti-blackness show up in the context of not only the academic training program, but also in the context of the counseling training program, wherever you find yourself doing your, your practicum related pieces. Um, I would like to submit to you or use the lens of white supremacy to talk about how it is that, that that anti-blackness may um, manifest itself. There was a great article um, that was brought to my attention er earlier this year, I think it was. And the title of the article is The Five Refusals of White Supremacy by Givens. 
Um, and I think I have a, a, a reference here that I can drop into the chat later. But Givens goes on to say that there are five inter interlocking principles um, that really set white supremacy up to survive. Um, and they operate, they're always operating all the time and they kind of play off of each other. Now I wanna put these up and then this is where I wanna spend most of the time here talking about um, how it is that we should be thinking about uprooting anti-blackness and then move into talking about what would it, what could it look like um, to, to have a first year foundational experience where we're focusing on um, black psychology. Here are the five principles or the five refusals of white supremacy. The refusal of the other's humanity and a tolerance for perpetual violence and exploitation. Now, what they also point out is that um, it's not only just a refusal to, to acknowledge it, but there's also this refusal to reckon with the, the types of violence that gets visited upon the bodies of Black people, the psyches of Black people, not only out in the world, but I want you to be thinking about in counseling psychology, in our classrooms, in our therapy rooms, in our lab rooms, wherever we, wherever, wherever we find ourselves. How is it that there is violence that plays out? Now, what I wanna say here about this um, and this goes directly to how it is that we should be thinking about changing the curriculum is this. Teaching theories that are steeped in whiteness, theories that promote individualistic ways of being as the norm, theories that identify white family dynamics as typical of all families, theories that suggest that the importance of extended kinship in black neighborhoods and churches um, as being um, abnormal, those theories are steeped in whiteness and therefore they're steeped in anti-blackness. Teaching theories that are fundamentally and conceptually stuck um, and silent about race and racism is the height of white racial hegemony, right? Some scholars have suggested that Freud, for example, took a universal approach to human behavior in his writing in order to avoid having his work viewed as an exploration of Jewish experiences. Thus, a person who was so pivotal to our field made the decision to erase part of himself and others from his own scholarship, thereby enshrining in his work a racelessness that we continue to struggle with to this day. Um, furthermore, some of the early theories may actually lend themselves to fostering anti-Black thought that labels Black people as savage, degenerate, or just lazy or wealth, welfare queens. That early theorizing still sets us up today, right? So that's just white hegemony in and of itself. And we keep putting it in front of students. And then we want to say, but then we'll teach something critical that helps us to think uh, differently about those theories. What I would want you to think about is that it would be tantamount to getting in your car and running over somebody and then saying, well, I'll call the ambulance to come help them, right? But you've already run over them and harmed them in some ways. We have to think about not putting harmful work in front of students because it just continues to promote white hegemony and anti uh, white hegemony and anti blackness. Right, um, teaching about the great white theorists without acknowledging their racist attitudes or attempts to be race neutral in order to have their work appear as universally um, human is anti black without an acknowledgement or earnest exploration of racial factors, including racism counseling psychology will be limited in conceptualizing or fostering black health and black futures, right? So we have to think about doing away with these theories from the very beginning. Or if we wanna teach them, we just need to teach them later after we've given students some real skills for being able to understand how it is that they can um, really bring some critical consciousness to those, to those theories, okay? Um, a few other things here that I think could be really important for us to think about when it comes to the training program, regardless of where you find yourself, academics or in a counseling setting. Um, um, oftentimes, one of the ways that violence happens is that our peers will say something that is racist or anti-Black, and nobody addresses it, right? Think about how that type of violence actually takes a toll on the psyches of, of Black people in the training program, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. Or think about it this way, in supervision, a Black trainee comes in and says that they're working with somebody who has espoused some racist values. One of the practices in psychology or in, in, in our practicum training is to tell that student, well, this will be a good training so that you can be able to learn some skills for being able to deal with this out in the real world. That is inherently anti-Black because it does not recognize the humanity of the person sitting in front of you. It says that they are either superhuman, subhuman, or unhuman, but it does not say that they are human. Right. So we have to think about how violence gets perpetrated in the training program and then think about what we need to do to get rid of it. One of the next pieces that Givens talks about is the refusal to listen to 
or to acknowledge the experience of the other. And I've already kind of given you some examples of what that could look like in the training program. <clears throat> but here, I also want to point out <clears throat> that one of the things that happens around Black psychology in particular is this. We will reserve Black thought for the multicultural course or for the diversity course or for the social justice course. We don't really want to believe that um, foundational thinking around um, psychological theories or research methods should be taught coming from a Black person's mind or imagination. So if, in fact, we are ghettoizing Black, Black, um, Black psychology by sticking it into the multicultural course, that in and of itself is our complicity in not paying attention to the experience of, of all people. Right. Um, we are doing what um, what what this author would say is that we're promoting this white hegemony by continuing to focus on these theories or these approaches that really center the experiences of white people. Even going back to um, the example that Dr. Helms was giving about the GRE, how it is that um, the numbers really bear out that we're talking about white people's experiences and not necessarily those of black people. Right. Some of the other ways that I think that we have to think about. Um, this showing up, not really paying attention to the experience of the other, is that we expect Black women to do a lot of care work in programs. What that does is that it doesn't necessarily regard the humanity or the needs of Black women because we cast them in these roles to take care of not only Black students, but all students, um, if in fact there are issues that need to be addressed. That too does not experience, that does not acknowledge the lived experience of Black women. The other way that this happens is that in uh, the conversations about race or racism, I know that I have seen this on, on a number of occasions. When in tense moments, a uh, comment gets shared or there is a dialogue about race or racism, what often happens is that a white person, oftentimes a white woman student, but sometimes a white male student might say, I don't feel safe or I don't feel safe enough to discuss these issues. There's little, there's generally very little acknowledgement that these types of attitudes are really based in a white centering type of um, diversity conversation that does not take into account the humanity, the pain, the expressions, the free gifts that Black people bring to these training programs. And we allow white people to sit in silence while not acknowledging that there are other people in the room who may be having other experiences. That has got to stop if, in fact, we want to challenge our students to be less anti black okay the next one is a refusal to confront the history of racial oppression and the ways it continues to shape the present i'm going to actually add these last two so that i can talk about these together the refusal to share space and also the refusal to face structural causes so here's what i want to say about this when in fact we think about putting black authors just in the multicultural diversity course that is one of the ways that we don't share space in, in the counseling psychology program. If in fact we fail to name whiteness in supervision and training spaces, what we are doing is we are not helping our trainees to actually deal with the history of racial oppression and the ways it continues to shape our actual present experiences. Here's the way that I want us to be thinking about this. For many of us, I know as a, as a black trainee or even as a black psychologist, a black supervisor, I know that for me, it is very typical to bring up race as an aspect of a counseling triad. If I'm the supervisor, there's a supervisee and there's a client. Or I know that if I'm, if I'm in a group setting, I'm going to bring up race because that is a part of the way that I show up. We oftentimes task trainees and clients with bringing up the issues around race and anti-Blackness, right? We don't necessarily have the expectation that unless you are a Black supervisor or a supervisor of color, that you're going to do that. One of the things that I want us to think about reimagining is how do you talk about whiteness no matter what's going on? If it's a white counseling triad, if it's a white group, um, a counseling group, if it's an all white faculty group, um, if it's an all white faculty leadership administration for um, a counseling psychology program, how do you talk about whiteness as you are dealing with issues related to um, therapy or tenure review? or admissions, right? How do you bring whiteness into the conversation so that we understand how it is influencing the decisions that are being made? If we don't bring whiteness into that conversation, what we are doing is further normalizing the silence around the very powerful ways that whiteness operates, which then continues to promote anti-Blackness. 
Um, as I think, again, I'm going to refer to something that Dr. Holmes wrote, the rejoinder to the four whiteness articles. She really points out here that we need white people to be engaged in conversations about whiteness, to be researching whiteness, to really be talking about it, because they are the experts on whiteness, right? If, in fact, white folks don't engage in that conversation, it's going to continue to um, negatively impact our, 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 our experiences. One of the last pieces that I want to highlight here is really connected to something that Dr. Helms talked about as well. It's the refusal to face structural causes. And what I want to say is that there is a refusal to, to really deal with white mechanisms in our science and in our practice. I'll use this as an example. Dr. Helms um, really led us in writing a paper back 10 years ago about reliability practices. In that paper, one of the things that we really highlighted was that if in fact that um, reliability is a property of samples, reliability is not a property of um, measures, right? And more often than not in the research or in the literature, we will see that people cite reliability as a characteristic of, a, of, a, of an instrument, when in fact it is about the sample, right? What we advocated in there is that people would report reliability coefficients for the racial groups or for the gender groups within their samples so that we could determine if in fact the race and the gendered groups were um, responding consistently to the measures. If they weren't cons uh, responding consistently to the measures, then what that's an indication of is that the measures are not necessarily capturing that construct for those particular populations. Now, let's bring it home. One of the things that I am privileged to do, um, much to my surprise, is that oftentimes people reach out to me from other campuses to serve on dissertation committees. Okay, I can do that, I'm a psychologist. Um, what I have been finding as I'm having these conversations is that we have um, students who are recruiting samples that are predominantly white, very much like what Dr. Holmes just talked about. What I hear over and over and over again when I'm in these conversations is that there are other committee members there who advocate for their trainees or their soon to be graduates to publish their, um, their data and to not necessarily take out these smaller populations of, of people of color um, in order to be able to say that this data that you have will generalize to the larger population. If, in fact, you have a population or a sample um, uh, for, for a research study and it is 70 percent white people and you then want to say that this generalizes to the larger population, that is actually promoting white hegemony. We have to really think about how it is that we would use not only the reliability characteristics to understand whether or not we are generalizing in a way that would be harmful. But we also have to begin to think, if I have 70% white people in this study about um, white male aggression, or if I have 70% um, white people in this study about LGBTQ religious ideas, then can't I publish a paper just about white people's experiences around that while leaving out the people of color so that we're not trying to generalize to all people, but we could talk about white folks? It could be a really important way of picking up the literature and moving in a way to talk more about whiteness. Okay. So that's a structural issue or sort of like a mechanism that I would encourage people to be thinking about. Here's the last few slides and I'm going to be out of the way. What would it look like? I want you to imagine what it would look like if you walked into your first year of your classes and these are some of the texts that you were dealing with, right? What if you got a chance to read Fance Frantz Fanon talking about how colonization has really affected the minds and bodies and psyches of both black and white folks? Okay. What if you were able to read Guthrie's critical analysis of how it is that whiteness has really shaped the development or the history of psychology? Or looking back at um, Jones's work around pet prejudice and racism, which is something that Dr. Holmes is still quoting to this day because it's such foundational work. Or to be multidisciplinary and focus on how Harriet Washington has really pointed out that in the history of helping professions, we have always, always, always poorly treated Black people. Okay, what would it look like to actually be in a class where um, there are black theories about how it is that black well-being could be brought about, whether or not it's focusing on African centered ways of thinking about that or African American centered ways of thinking about black healing and futures. Okay, what would it look like for you to be in your theories course and to have to start not with Freud, not with Beck, not with Rogers, but to start with Cross and Helms talking about racial identity development theory as being the tools that you then get to look at all of this other stuff. Why? Because it's all racial.
racialized, but without having a racial lens or a racial tool to be able to pick up on how whiteness is showing up, to be able to pick up on how racism is showing up in those other, other theories, we are actually just giving people harmful uh, messages that will end up harming black people, okay? Now, here's my last thought is this. I read a few years ago, or actually I didn't read this, I've read a part of this. Um, this is actually from Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noesi's um, uh, uh, dissertation study. Um, Teresa Perry wrote a book called Young, Gifted, and Black, Promoting High Achievement Among African Americans. This was back in 2004. She tells the story of, of exploring the uh, what we now call the opportunity gap, but back then I think she was looking at it as sort of like the racial achievement gap. She talked to a lot of different people. She tells the story of going to Iowa and walking through a cornfield um, with an old black woman. And they got to talking about why it is that black students might not be achieving at the same rate. And the black woman put this on the table, which I want all of us to really think about. She said this, if the corn doesn't grow, nobody asks what's wrong with the corn. They might ask questions about the soil, about the water, about the environment. But if the corn don't grow, don't nobody ask nothing about the corn. What I want you to be thinking about is what questions do we need to be asking about our training programs in order to be able to uproot the anti-Blackness that is being seeded in them? And my final question to everybody would be this, what Black psychology resources would you suggest for transforming training in the academic and counseling settings? Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Green. I think if we remain comfortable, it's gonna be hard to grow. So I really appreciate those, those comments. And uh, for those that were uncomfortable, that's probably what they needed. Next up, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Della V. Mosley. Dr. Mosley is a Black queer feminist, scholar, activist, and healer committed to liberation. Dr. Mosley created and leads the Wellness, Equity, Love, Liberation, and Sexuality, or Wales, Wells Healing Research and Consultative Collective, which is housed within Radical Healing Durham, formerly at the University of Florida. She is the co-founder and director of the Anti-Racism Training and Black Healing Initiative, Academics for Black Survival and Wellness. Broadly, Dr. Della's work focuses on facilitating the wellness of Black and or queer and transgender people of color and is undergirded by Black feminism and liberation psychology. She uses practical, evidence-based, and culturally mindful approaches to fight oppression and facilitate the healing and liberation of Black and or queer and transgender people of color. Dr. Della has published in top-tier journals, is an award-winning researcher, has been invited to speak internationally, and is engaged in radical social justice advocacy work. She is an APA Minority Fellow, co-authors the Psychology Today blog, Healing Through Social Justice, with the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective, and recently gave a TED Talk titled, Moving from Woke to Working for Black Futures. Welcome, Dr. Mosley. Thank you so much, Katie. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe I'm here in conversation with these incredible, incredible luminaries and following Dr. Helms and, uh, Dr. Neville and Dr. Green, that was a full flex. Thank you, thank you all. Um, and I'm excited to share my big idea with you all, which I've titled Get Out, Transform into a Counseling Psychology for Black Wellness. Um, basically, you can expect an analysis and an idea for Black Wellness using the film, the 2017 film Get Out as an analogy. Uh, if you haven't seen that film, it's old, you should have seen it by now, because I'm about to give a lot of it away. And um, if you're Black, and if you've ever heard me talk, I talk a lot about anti-Black racism as well as how we resist, but I invite Black folks particularly to take care of yourselves and do what you need to do to be well as we have this conversation. And my big idea is really about getting out the way of Black wellness. And I think that if as a discipline we did that, if as individuals we push for it, there is, um, yeah, that you should be warned that you can experience isolation, depression, camaraderie, self-worth, liberation, job loss, job gain. Oh, there's a whole lot that comes from, from doing this work of liberation. And um, some of you may have already experienced it. And, and so maybe you can add to the conversation about what else people can expect if you get out of the way of Black wellness. So I'm going to start out by uh, drawing some parallels and providing some context. Um, comparing the field of counseling psychology to the Armitage community, the, the community that um, Get Out is primarily set in. I'll talk a little bit about the terrors of the sunken place, particularly for Black folks engaging with counseling psychology. I'll talk briefly about how we get hypnotized and then spend some time on, on the big idea of getting out of the trap and transforming counseling psychology. So 
in this picture you see uh, on the left this character Chris and his girlfriend Rose, Rose Armitage. I think that the the Armitage community where Chris gets recruited into is very similar in some ways to counseling psychology. We get recruited into universities. We're socialized to believe that academia is a path towards safety, towards financial freedom, fun even. In the film, Rose warns Chris, like gives a little bit of warning about what he's about to get himself into. You know, She says that her dad would say that he would vote for Obama a third time if he could. So beware, you're gonna get that, that oddness, right? Um, and like many folks in our, when we're applying for jobs, for internships, when we're um, move, going to find our doc programs, we might, we're definitely gonna ask, is it safe for black folks here? And someone might tell you, well, yeah, so-and-so has good intentions, but sometimes they say the wrong thing, you know? But they don't say, so-and-so retaliates and, wield, and wildly wields their power when you tell them that they've said the wrong thing, right? Or when you let them know that they said the wrong thing. In this case, Rose didn't say, my dad voted for Obama twice, but he's kidnapped a dozen Black folks in my lifetime. We're told that academia will give us the degree. We will not know what we have to face to get it. We're told that a tenure track job is a coveted path to stability, but not the ways in which we black women especially will be degraded while receiving that stable check. That we can engage in our study of black psychology or liberation psychology or healing racial trauma, but not that we will be tokenized, fetishized or otherwise ostracized. Like your research is so sexy is, is tantamount to Chris being told that black people are in fashion, right? See Dr. Candace Hargan's podcast, How to Love a Human, for more on this for myself and others. We're told that we'll be able to afford a decent home or apartment in a university town, but not that our neighbors will call the police on us for doing our work on our patio or hanging out with our colleagues. This is my reality, the reality of my mentees and comrades. For Black people coming to counseling psychologists for care, they're told that you can get therapy to reduce your anxiety or depression but not that they'll be working with folks who aren't required to deeply interrogate and constantly work to eradicate their anti-Blackness, creating a barrier to their, our continued engagement with, within mental health care when harm does happen. Those who come to participate um, in many of our studies, they're told, oh, you get a chance to win a $25 gift card and to contribute to the science of whatever in counseling psychology that we're interested in, but not that there isn't a black person on the research team or that they won't ever even get to read the article that comes out about their experience or that it may not even be written in a language that's meant to be accessible for them or that all we'll do is publish it and move on to the next study versus moving to engage in the actions that the findings from that research told us that would allow more wellness for black folks. They don't know how our system is set up. And when Black folks tell you this, when I tell you this, I hope that you can trust it, but I want to take a moment to shout out and acknowledge my incredible research assistants on this talk, Sunshine and Haley Pegram, who um, have provided and helped to find some incredible resources to back this up. But trust Black people. We've been telling you these truths for a while. Please continue to think about and stretch this metaphor in the chat. What are you aware that Black folks seeking services from counseling psychologists in any way lack informed consent about? What are Black counseling psychologists and trainees denied access to whole truths about when we're recruited? In counseling psychology and in Get Out, there is hidden knowledge that the white folks, the folks who have been there for generations, know that the Black newcomers do not know. Knowledge that is critically important to our survival and wellness. If you can look at Rose and say, how could you bring this talented Black person into your community and set them up for harm? I beg you to look at yourselves and your colleagues. Dr. Green just broke down so many ways that harm is going to happen from day one in the training programs. Are you giving informed consent? Do you even know what Black people experience in your spaces so that you can give informed consent? Can Black people trust you to tell you their truths? Big idea? Quit bringing Black people into your spaces without giving them real informed consent about what they are getting into. And Chris was isolated. He left his community behind to go on this adventure, to grow with his partner, in our case, to grow into our careers. You see him here meeting all these older white people in the community, not knowing the way that they actually see him. Like many psychologists of all races, we leave our community and family behind to pursue training. Once there, we're distanced, not only from our people, but from what we know. The knowledges that have previously been a part of our life get pushed to the back or dismissed in many ways as we learn our new discipline. For some black folks, uh, for black folks, some of us may know that we are being taught repackaged versions of everyday cultural knowledges that our folks have been using forever to experience wellness. 
but some of us may not. We may happily soak up the new material, glorify the colonizers who have been effective at advancing their theories and methods, and increase our own internalized anti-Blackness. Even as Chris tries to connect with a few Black people in the neighborhood, he realizes they don't speak his language. They don't move how he moves. They are caught in the trap, playing their role, surviving. I don't know about you, but I know several older Black academics and Black psychologists who would fall into this category. People who told me to sleep in my office and work nonstop in order to be accepted, who told me to straighten my hair for interviews and to not be so entitled as to ask for an equitable educational experience. Who do you think you are, diva? We do not always have access to a community that can provide emotional and social support, which is critical to radical healing. Chris had no one in that community. That's the case for many Black folks as they engage with counseling psychology. The Black counseling psychology student, the Black client, the Black research participant, we're all entering a space with limited to no community. We are the outsider coming in. And then not only do we not have community, we are operating in a setting in which there is no accountability to the Black community, where the norm is to use and do harm to Black folks. Chris is given education on the harms of cigarette smoking by Rose's dad. Like we're given educa education on certain psychological concepts, but not the education that's gonna be the most relevant to us and the maintenance of our personal and the broader Black community's wellness. The busyness or the business of counseling psychology, like the hustle and bustle of the family dinner and the big party that Chris had to attend once in the neighborhood, keeps us and kept him from really being able to think about and strategize ways to resist the harm that's being that's happening or pending. As Toni Morrison said, it's important to know who the real enemy is and to know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work, keeps you explaining over and over again. None of that is necessary. We in counseling psychology are doing a lot that is not necessary. Like, let's be real. We know that Black academics as students and uh, that counseling psychologists in the field from clinical folks working and doing clinical work to faculty and beyond, we bear a burden of being tasked with clients, committee roles, course assignments, and more that require more time than our white colleagues. When it's not required, many of us often overperform expectations because we have been taught directly and indirectly that we need to work 10 times as hard to have the same financial wellness, safety, et cetera, as our white counterparts. And that goes for our Black clients who feel like if they're not the perfect client that they won't receive services, to our Black counseling psychology students who take no shortcuts and provide five citations for every claim they make in a in a class essay versus the zero to one citations that their white peers might incorporate. And black people who come to the Armitage neighborhood end up hypnotized and then paralyzed. I'll take later talk later about how we in counseling psychology all may get hypnotized. But for now, I want to draw parallels between Chris's paralysis and black folks paralysis when engaging in counseling psychology. We get stuck to where we have limited options for how we can move once in engaging with counseling psychology. Let me talk first of our clients, participants, the students in our classes or programs. We hold the power. They come to us. We tell them what options they have for how they can work with us, what we can offer them. The options are limited and derived from us. We limit possibilities. All Chris could do was be a host body for the white man who wanted to use him for his great eye as a photographer. He was given limited options for what he could do within that space. This process is also true when it comes to our counseling psych trainees. In our upcoming chapter on um, Black scholar activism in Dr. Kevin Coakley's book, Making Black Lives Matter, two counseling psychology trainees and mentees, comrades of mine, Jeanette Mejia and Garrett Ross, they raised a question of why they were required to take the number of stats methods courses that they had to take but were not allowed the space in their program of study or the resources to take the qualitative methods courses that would really benefit them for what they are trying to study. The counseling psych neighborhood is one of limited possibilities. And if or when one resists, as Chris does throughout the film and really at the end, there are so many risks. The research participant who refuses to answer questions that demeans them risk having their data excluded from the analysis being erased. The client who refuses to attend group therapy and be the only black person in that group risks being told they have to go outside of the center, outside of that space in order to get care. 
the students who develop a thoughtful list of asks or demands related to reducing anti-blackness in their counseling program or department risks not, not getting letters of recommendation or other forms of sponsorship from the faculty. What else, y'all? Please use the chat to share how a paralysis can happen for Black folks engaging in counseling psychology because of risks associated with resisting. And finally, this movie, this counseling psych experience is a colonization project, period. The Armitages and those in their cult are literally colonizing the bodies of Black folks. Chris is dropped into what they call the sunken place. He's in a basement with a beat up chair and an old school TV, poor conditions. I think about the conditions we bring our clients, students, patients, participants into. Are they brought into an inclusive, welcoming, warm space where they can see themselves represented and experience environmental wellness as they work with us? Generally not. If they are, it's because an individual counseling psychologist has made a choice to practice that kind of inclusion, often at their own expense. But not because there's a counseling psych standard that requires our counseling, research, teaching settings to be inclusive. Big idea, let's set this as a standard. Once a black body has been taken over by the cult, then even though that black person creates something of value, it is owned by the white colonizer. That's the norm in counseling psychology, especially for academic researchers. Our intellectual property is not ours, but the university's. We cannot make the full gains possible to reduce the black racial wealth gap because our copyrights or patents will be shared with the universities. For those engaged in clinical work, and developing brilliant interventions and programs, it's the clinical setting that reaps the greatest reward. Big idea, tapping onto Dr. Neville's brilliant idea, let's move towards reparations. Reparations would be allowing Black folks to own and gain financial wealth from their contributions, perhaps even setting up programs that would help facilitate this process, systematizing them within counseling psych. And Chris is under constant surveillance and we know Black folks engaging with CPR from our clients to our students. After Rose's mom hypnotizes and sends Chris into the sunken place, Jim Hudson appears on the screen, television screen, to explain to him what's happening. He says, a sliver of you will still be in there somewhere, limited consciousness. You'll be able to see and hear what your body is doing, but your existence will be as a passenger, an audience. You'll live in the sunken place. And maybe you're saying, hey, Della, if you're comparing counseling psych to the sunken place, then I take issue with that. We aren't as bad as they are in biology or journalism or even clinical psychology. You might think I've just got an agenda and I won't be satisfied, but give me a few more minutes and let me tell you about the terrors of the sunken place. To be lost and disoriented as a Black person, to be taken into a system that you do not know you can locate wellness within can be terrifying. The fear, anxiety, Cultural mistrust, paranoia, costs energy, costs health for Black folks. The constant contorting and code switching is exhausting. Black people lose themselves. In losing themselves, they then lose contact with or become even more distanced from their Black communities that they may have previously been connected to. If we think about our clients, we can imagine the terrible cost to their mental health if they cannot show up as themselves in the room if they're contorting and code switching or the loss that occurs if our research participants cannot tell us their truths. Counseling site cannot stay in the sunken place if Black people are going to be well. And the terror of having unmet needs and expectations isn't just that you have an unmet need or expectation, it's that feeling associated with being ignored when your needs have been made known. It's that feeling with seeking out safety and wellness and realizing, oh, there is a real void here, but I'm stuck here. My need, I need to stay in this space, but my needs are going to be unmet while I stay here. Hmm. Theft is terror. In the sunken place, our minds and bodies are captive and we are using them as we are told, not necessarily as we need to, to ensure our wellness or the wellness of our folks. Our time is stolen. What we study, where our emotional energy goes while we study, fighting the microaggressions, fighting the racism. It's often externally determined, and I have already spoke to how intellectual property is stolen. This violence is terrible. A system that is anal analogous to the sunken place is a system that not only allows white violence, but then it contributes, causes, encourages horizontal violence, competition among Black folks who are seeking our services, or the Black students and Black counseling psychologists in various job settings who are trying to survive the white supremacy culture that they're in. The culture that keeps us busy, keeps us stuck, takes us away from our work, from our community, 
that distances us, makes us forget, rewards us when we forget. That's a violent experience for Black folks. And all of this loss and violence can create sadness, grief. Hello, it's racial trauma. Dr. Helms, Dr. Green, Dr. Neville been talking to you about this, talking to our field about it for decades. And for those who can escape, who end up escaping, if, if the counseling psych is a sunken place, you came to it to achieve some financial wellness or to do some good to, to work your calling, and then you find that you have to escape it, that's another loss. And we grieve those losses. But it's complicated. Counseling psychology is so much more. It provides access to middle class possibilities for a Black person like me. Um, it gives us access to a community that's respected, that can provide some support that can help us advance in certain ways, whether that's the black client getting an intervention that can help them overcome a mental health issue or the, the black healer nerd who always wanted to be a helper and now gets to grow in a community with other black healer nerd helpers, right? Chris was enamored with Rose. He was drawn to and wanted to help the black helpers who were there. It was complicated. It was so complicated. He didn't wanna leave them behind. And there's meaning and purpose here. He had a role, a direction that he was supposed to be moving in. People who were counting on him and who needed him. Although harm was done, a sense of meaning and purpose would have been accessible to him as it is to us black folks in or seeking services from counseling psychology. What else? What other terrors of the sunken place exist? Or what other complications can we parse out? Because it's there's so much gray here. And I just wanna talk briefly about how we get hypnotized before I bring us home with the big idea. We counseling psychologists and trainees, we are hypnotized by ego. We get sucked into a system of recognition, community, adoration. My ego is fed by the awards I receive, the lines I get to add to my CV, the students who apply to work with me, I get hypnotized. Also by my survival needs in a capitalist society, by our student loan or other debt, or the fact that our affiliation with a university might allow us to write that off, right? We're living in a capitalist society, and so we need to stay sometimes in places that are harmful to us. Rose's mom stirred that teacup and put Chris right to sleep, and the pre-laid out paths that are inherent in our discipline also do the work of hypnotizing us. We like to follow a routine, follow the rules, the steps that's laid out, and this track that many of us are on, it's also easy to just lull ourselves to sleep and go along on the path that's been laid out for us. The pace also hypnotizes us. Grants are due, grades are due, annual reviews, quals, dissertation, prac, hustle, hustle. Your body gets in the pattern. We run in the circle, and so she doesn't need to spin that spoon around. We spin around the track according to these cycles. And if you add the stress of the coronavirus pandemic to it, to all of these hypnotic tricks, then we are really in deep. So my big idea. The sunken place is such a great name and metaphor because it is below the radar. It is hidden. I propose that we get real honest and open about being in the sunken place so that we can transform counseling psychology into a discipline that is not only good for the Black folks who are in it, but for the Black folks who are seeking to be served through it. We got to get out denial, quit lauding ourselves as the social justice psychologists that are saving Black lives, and acknowledge our historical and current relationship to Black survival or death to Black suffering or Black wellness. We need truth and reconciliation, and I believe it's possible for us. We need to understand how we got here as well as what has been successful when it comes to breaking us out. Dr. Janet Helms' incomparable work on white racial identity and development of convenings like the Diversity Challenge, those are pathways out. Dr. Carlton Green's expertise with the art and science of counseling psychology needs to be documented. He holds space practices and encourages bravery and has an unmatched ability to create conversations, spaces, programs, educational experiences that change people's behaviors and their identities as anti-racist. He knows the pathway out of the sunken place. Dr. Helen Neville's vision of radical healing, development of multiple collectives that promote Black wellness, her accessible podcast and blog, her deep commitment to engaging in sustainable community-based work, her willingness to bring young Black folks to academic conferences to tell their own truths. She and that is how Black folks and counseling psychology comes up out of the sunken place. But you don't have to take my word for it. The big idea is that we commit to studying what in counseling psychology is the most facilitative of Black liberation, Black wellness. What prevents racial trauma for Black youth in schools? 
for Black elderly folks in healthcare settings? What facilitates thriving for Black queer healer scholar activists like myself and my mentee comrades? Can we get more folks exploring how counseling psychology can truly be a conduit to Black wellness? Can we listen to Black folks and review the existing scholarship about what in or associated with counseling psychology is harmful to Black folks and stop that? To do this, I think we need to really assess where we all are on the critical consciousness of anti-Black racism continuum. We need to protect those Black counseling psychologists and trainees who have the power to save us. We need to know that we are not alone in seeking to transform counseling psych and find the signposts that point us to others who can help get us out. We need to create those signposts when we find ways to get out ourselves. This webinar, this recording is a signpost. We will need to share it, recall it. Chris was saved by his best friend who you see here. That trusty friend loved him, cared about him, checked on him, followed up on him. When he couldn't reach Chris, he showed up to get him and get him out of harm's way. Do you have that friend? Can you be that person? Thank you, Dr. Neville, for being that mentor and friend for me. And finally, Chris was fighting to save himself. He realized that a flash of the camera could snap a Black person out of the sunken place momentarily. Can we identify the technologies and interventions that provide this grounding for Black folks? Can we even work on developing new methods of doing this? Jordan Peele, the director you see here, is creating a new genre. Academics for Black Lives, the Anti-Racism Training and Black Wellness Initiative, co-founded by the incredible Paris Bellamy and I. That was a new creation, a new technology to snap folks woke and hopefully get them out of the sunken place. Counseling psychologists have so, so many dope skills and tools that make us well positioned to usher forward a new technology, genre, discipline, that actually helps Black folks be well, holistically well. Well as a Black person who is a part of the discipline and well as a Black person receiving or participating in services with a counseling psychologist. So I end by asking you, will you get out of the way of Black wellness counseling psychology? Can we finally transform our field so that Black wellness is facilitated through it? Let's transform. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Della. And thank you to all four of our, our presenters today. Before I open it up um, to those in attendance to see what comments or questions they have, we are gonna give some time for our presenters to maybe to react to each other. <clears throat> but the, in thinking about all of what you shared, I really appreciate Dr. Neville's title, like radical reimagining, because I feel like that's a common thread that we heard through all of the presenters. Like how do we reimagine the way we have admissions? How do we reimagine how we teach psychology? How do we reimagine wellness in psychology? I was really touched about the uh, informed consent, uh, Dr. Dell, and really thinking about from someone who has a training program, in what ways am I complicit in anti-Blackness, you know, regards to how, what I choose to train, what I choose, the models that APA says I need to have, uh, you know, with regards to my standards on accreditation, et cetera. And so I think there's a lot that we can glean. I'm gonna ask Dr. Cruz to put the questions you asked in the chat, if, assuming she hasn't already done that, for the, those in attendance to begin to, to uh, ponder on. But I'm curious, uh, Dr. Neville, Dr. Della, Dr. Hounds, and Dr. Green, what reactions do you have to anything you heard today or comments? And we have 16 minutes. Abolish the GRE. Thank you, Dr. Hounds. Cancel the white hegemony. Thank you, Dr. Green. Mm. I was going to say, too, I think that the piece about the GRE that Dr. Helms was putting on the table was really profound. And just the um, the metaphor around the baking of the cake to understand who or what would influence the taste. Um, of course, Dr. Helms needs to write that up somewhere and put that out there so people can get that in them, because it, it's really about now it's not only about the GRE, but it's also about so many of the other statistics that we use. It's such a powerful way of thinking about it. And if we abolish the GRE, what would we use? Would it just trickle down and then grad students are submitting SAT scores? I, I, I'm working on getting rid of SAT scores too. But, but is, isn't that what all of the presenters have been suggesting that we reconceptualize how it is we think about what we do? Uh, I find it intriguing to think about, for instance, using Black media to talk about experiences in our courses, or actually using some of the Black uh, intellectual scholarship 
to expose everyone to that. And I don't, that doesn't seem to me to be such a hard thing to do. It would just require professors who are not necessarily black to read the same kinds of materials so that they can have intelligent discussions too. I don't know if Dr. Neville's still there. She's not visible because we couldn't ping her. Oh, yeah, I'm still here. I'm just taking in all of this wonderful, wonderful information. I'm loving, I mean, definitely abolish all standardized tests. I love all the, um, you know, I need to sit back and listen to all of the gems that Dr. Uh, Green uh, dropped about how we need to teach things differently, um, all the way from theories to research and love everything that Dr. Della was talking about in terms of healing and what really stuck to me, you know, bringing it home at the end about what ways can we promote and, and are working on healing of black folks, both within our field, but also the communities that are really suffering. So I'm just feeling well fed at this moment. I think I would go back to something that, that, that Dr. Noble was sharing at the beginning. They're, they're reimagining the reparations um, I think that we were all talking about harm to Black people, um, which is not necessarily something in the white imagination, right, or in white language that we actually get a chance to talk very much about. Um, but what would it look like to actually talk about how it is that counseling psychology has harmed not only uh, or has used tools that harm clients, but how has counseling psychology harmed trainees and faculty? Right. What would it look like to have a real conversation about that such that we don't continue to lose people? Um, there was a part of me as we were leading up to this, I kept thinking about should I, I was thinking about putting out sort of like a Twitter poll to see if there would be counseling psychologists who would respond and say um, whether or not they're leaving or whether or not they've had difficult experiences. And I just shot away from doing it. But it would be interesting to hear about the experiences of Black people who have left our discipline, which is probably we perceive as being one of the more accepting. Um, but folks have left because of the violence um, that's involved in the in the discipline, in the training. Which is a challenge, because I think the fewer you are in numbers and the, the more challenging it may be to speak up. And that's exactly what we need, you know. But like, who's willing to put their neck out there, especially for those of folks in academia who are trying to get tenure? Which, which is kind of a problem. Um, I heard wonderful ideas and I'm, I see lots of wonderful people listening to those ideas, but I'm worried that sometimes conversation is taken as action. When in fact, conversation is just conversation. So the question is, I guess I would like people to ponder that I didn't ask is how can we take all of the presentations we heard and turn those into action? Um, I don't want us to spend all of our time gazing at our navels, talking about how we've wronged black people. I want us to think about how we can change what it is that uh, we've heard needs to be changed in the system. Absolutely. My team and, and I were on a separate project that I think they'll be talking about tomorrow. Um, did a med qualitative metasynthesis looking at the qualitative work on black LGBT, LGB folks over the last 10 years. And we were just heartbroken by looking at these 106 studies and seeing over and over again, all these same findings and saying someone should, and at the end, it's all like someone should do an intervention about this, but there are no, inter, there, the number of intervention papers in our synthesis was so low. Like there were like four interventions. It's just everyone looking again to see what the problems are, saying what needs to be done and then continuing to write and publish instead of creating change for black folks. Conversation is not action. I appreciate that, Dr. Holmes. I think that if, if, if Dr. Holmes's question raises something really important, um, I was having a conversation with another counseling psychologist who has left the who has left us, right? Um, and her husband actually pointed out something as we were talking about how it is that we talk about race um, in in the context of training. Um, her husband noted, uh, well, y'all are talking about what's written in these academic journals, but do the academics know how to actually talk about race? Do they know how to do this in a, so like in a process related in a personal way? Um, and it was really, so like, it was a moment for me, you think like, oh, 
that that might actually be true that this is not necessarily the skill um i think that dr combs helms's question might be at might be really getting at who has the skills to to put some of these things into action right faculty members or scholars get trained to do the writing um who are the folks who are going to do the dreaming or do the or the dream building as the, uh, dr della and um Dr. Neville said, right, is that, are those the black counseling psychology people that we don't bring into the field who would actually do the dream building? Um, or are there, you know, are there, are there folks here who can be thinking about what do I need to do? What do I build? What do I act on? Yeah, I really like, um, I so appreciate this question about the actions. And I think um, I'm, torn on the one hand is wanting to uh, definitely begin to identify here are some actions we need to move forward on here's what we need to do without reflection um, and many times actions and i'm guilty of this uh, go into individual responsibility what individuals will do and not what groups of people will do and so really having a clear understanding about what we as individual psychologists can do to begin to address this but what is Division 17 willing to do right now, today? What are they willing to commit to doing to uh, move the conversation forward, but also turn these wonderful ideas into actions and having a timeline for doing that um, and an accountability for that? And I think that the, I'd love to see that kind of commitment. That's a great idea. Moving beyond a work group, I think we're all on work groups. But you know, what's what's the actual action that's going to lead lead to change? So at this time, we have just under ten minutes. Um, so why don't we open it up? I'm going to remove the pen so we can see everyone and definitely welcome comments, questions from those in attendance. We appreciate your your joining us today. Are we taking questions from the audience now? Yes, Please. yeah, yes, yes, exactly. There's a fair amount of dialogue. I'm sure there's a question out there. You see that first question and then it'll be nonstop or even a comment. Maybe there was something in the chat that they you might uh, use. Somebody did write, um, they were kind of like two questions that were guided towards our presentation, Dr. Helms. Is reading the materials about Black scholars enough to affect the thinking within counseling psychology, or is that just a starting point? And then somebody also question, wrote the question, um, is ridding ourselves of the SAT merely relo relocating a piece of furniture in the room that is institutional racism? Okay, SAT, we didn't talk about. Uh, GRE, um, that, that is essentially a form of institutional racism. And so I guess my perspective would be if, you, if we can remove a form of institutional racism, then we've made a giant step. Imagine what it would mean, for instance, for Division 17, which is one of the largest divisions in the uh, APA, to say, we are not using the GRE anymore in our admissions process. Now that's going to freak the accreditation people out because they require programs to submit GREs. But what if we were just say we're not doing that anymore, and then figure out what it is that we would do that uh, reflected the counseling psychology values? Wouldn't that be fun? I agree. I think that you, you know, listen to Dr. Helms talk about that. It also makes me think about just the suggestion that we replace who we learn about or we replace the, um, the theories or the, the voices that we use to teach in, cl in classes. It also means that we would also then be looking at how do we do something about the EPPP um, that doesn't necessarily, um, uh, that uses, that, that's based on the, the, the knowledge of the traditional um, uh, accreditation program, right? Um, if we were sort of like reimagining what an accredited program looked like, then we'd also have to begin thinking about how do we partner with other people in APA or with whoever it is, at the, I forget who does the test, right? Um, how it is that we would redo that test or get rid of that test, which too is also a form of institutional racism. There's some comments in the chat regarding the each will pee as well. And I see Dr. O has his hand raised. 
Yes, uh, the question I have is as um, a person in their middle of their career, how do we make sure we're reaching back, encouraging our graduate students who are having a hell of a time in these programs that are toxic towards black scholarship and not only just the doctorate level, but also our master's level therapists who are in many ways seeing a much larger group than the doctorate level therapists. So I'm wondering how can we be good mentors um, to assure that the next generation or that there is a next generation that follows us in our fields. I, I, um, I'll, I'll start and then I'd love to hear what other folks have to say. What a thought provoking, excellent question. And I don't know about others, but part of my hesitancy was here. What's required could also be counterproductive for your own health. So how is it that you can both um, prioritize your own health and mental health and create a system in which we are reaching back. And so that, that balance is important. But I think some of the things that we definitely need to do is that we need to, um, one, model what that behavior looks like. And unfortunate, that means that we do not silence ourselves in meeting and public spaces, that we model what naming racism is, calling people out on it and identifying allies that can help support it. That can be, um, and if you're mid-career, you have some level of protection. So it just takes some additional energy into doing that. Um, fighting for students behind the doors. When the doors are closed, as all of us who've been in those spaces, what we know is that whiteness operates and it operates to undermine the talent and development of black students. And that is where, and trainees, that's where we need to lean in hard on in terms of naming that as whiteness uh, and sticking up for the students, um, being the student's advocate and warrior and to, realize, and to help other people realize that white students have the same issues. So to really adopt um, an affirmative, validating, humanizing approach to students, both in front of and behind closed doors. I think those are some simple things that we can do as individuals. And then obviously becoming more involved in organizations and, and um, you know, working with allies to create some structural change. And then also fighting for a more black people to be in this space, because you need more numbers to actually push for the transformation. I would just add to that, that often we are in programs where there is only one of us, uh, meaning one black person. But sometimes um, we can uh, have I, I want us to move beyond allies, but I'll start with that. Sometimes we can have white allies in institutions who we can train to become uh, more than allies, collaborators, if you will. So I kind of think about it as a supervision model. If uh, students had someone that they could go to in addition to the black faculty, who actually, if they didn't know how to deal with the issue, would do some consultation with the black faculty so that they could learn how to do it, and then all of the burden would not be on the one black person to make sure that there was a pipeline. So we've got to, we've got to work on building systems. I would also say that for black faculty, we need to work on building ourselves a network so that when it gets too much, we can reach out to that network and say, help me, it's too much. What do I do in this particular situation? Because often I think we're functioning uh, on our own by ourselves, trying to make things happen. And we make a lot of things happen, but we can make a lot more things happen if we had someone who was looking out for our needs as well. Thank you for that. And I see we're at time. So I wanna thank Drs. Neville, Green, Dr. Della and Dr. Helms for their uh, thought provoking ideas today. And I guess I would leave us with one, the question that Dr. Neville started with, like, what are we doing to support liberation as well as what are we gonna do? What's the action step? So move beyond the, the talking that we, we, we heard from today, but what's the action step that we can each individually take uh, to move us forward. 
this is being recorded, so you, uh, um, feel free to reach back and view it in the future. But thank you all again for, uh, for participation today, and we'll see you in the future. Take care. I don't want to leave, but I, I got to. <laughs> I got to interview for a black psychologist in two they minutes, need, so I got to go. They need you, Brian. They need you there. <laughs>